Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and I'd like to introduce my guest today, Robert Whitehair. And you don't mind if I call you Bob? Please, Bob. Yes. yes. And, and uh, Bob is a Beverly resident. And uh, Bob has written a book, which I'm going to hold up here, which is called American Buyout. And uh, this is a book uh, about the U.S. economy that draws some startling conclusions about the direction in which our economy is heading. And uh, it predicts some drastic outcomes in the near or midterm future unless we do something. And that something is uh, embodied in a plan that you, that you have. And uh, before we get into that, uh, Bob, uh, I think our, our audience, in, in view of what you're going to talk about, would like to know what, what is your background or what, what gives you the credentials to talk about uh, the economy and, and so forth. Now, I know you're, you're a mathematician and an economist. Give us a little, a little uh, a summary of your background. Well, I, I have a Ph.D. from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in computer science, specifically artificial intelligence. Um, but if, uh, if you know who uh, Herb Simon is, he, he is a computer scientist who won a Nobel Prize in economics where uh, decision-making is basically a function of economic thought. So my background, although it's in computer science, it's really tied into economics. And I've been doing economic modeling, financial modeling, since the mid '70s. Okay, so you've got so. quite a quite a bit of experience in that. Now, I'm I, I'm not an economist. Uh, I I've read the book, and I will be I uh, will be truthful with with you and with our audience. Uh, I did read some of it, some sections of it very carefully, uh, but I also skimmed other sections. But I think what I'd like to to talk about is what I, I feel is the very meat of of, of what you have to say. Uh, in this book. Um, now, you, you claim in the book that all current economic theory is wrong, and um, that you say that by following current ideas, uh, this has and will continue to lead to greater and greater disaster, and we're going to talk about that. And you, you paint a very dire picture, which includes global economic collapse and the end of civilization as we know it. I mean, that, that, that's pretty powerful. And this is not going to happen in the next century. It's going to happen in the next few words. And I'll quote from, uh, from the book on page 174, if I, if I might. Um, the U.S. economy is about to become very ill. Today, far too many full-time workers live in poverty. In the next 10 to 20 years, there will be an enormous increase in the number of full-time workers who are struggling to avoid poverty. These people are going to be very, very angry. And sincere, well-intentioned economic scientists will devise treatments based on conventional economic theory. Such treatments will kill the U.S. economy. The U.S. will not survive. What happens to the U.S. won't really matter, though. The illness will be global. The global economy will not survive and civilization as we know it will end. Now, that, that's, um, <laughs> that's quite a statement uh, to, to uh, greet a reader of, of your book. So, um, uh, well, let's, let's talk about why you think that um, uh, current economic theory is, is wrong. What's wrong with current economic theory? Um, it... it is incapable of predicting outcome and explaining observation. So uh, current economic theory cannot really be used to plan a solution. And the problem with it is very simple. It's, it comes down to one simple equation. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Now, what you just said is the basis of a, of a scientific theory, right? Correct. I mean, Correct. I mean, to be able to predict uh, outcomes and explain explain uh, what's happened. That's what a scientific theory does. Correct. And as long as it keeps doing that, then you believe this is this is how physics works. This is how chemistry works. Right. If it stops doing that, then you have to find some new theory. Exactly. So. Uh, uh, I guess the, the, the question would be that um, you, you talk about uh, Newtonian economics as, as what you're, you're saying should, should sort of supersede economics as we know it now, economic theory. So explain, 
how uh, Newtonian economics is different than current economic theory? Um, I'm a huge fan of Isaac Newton and the transformation that he brought to the world with Newtonian physics was the notion of causality. So things happened for a reason. So uh, rustling of tree leaves was caused by wind. There's a force applied caused the leaves to move. <clears throat> it wasn't spirits. It wasn't leprechauns. It, there was a physical causality. With modern economic theory, there's no notion of causality. They, they try things, for example, lowering interest rates, they think will have a certain effect. But very often it doesn't. So it's, it's almost like praying to gods with, <laughs> with, and I know economists won't necessarily like that, but modern economic theory has no notion of causality in it yeah. that, that actually works, that actually can be used to create a mechanism to fix a known problem. Yeah. And, and you, in the book, you detail, uh, you detail a, a plan to, to stave off these disasters that we, that we just mentioned. And according to your plan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read what you say that it will, it will do, okay? Uh, the, 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 the Newtonian economics approach, it will provide a livable wage, livable mm -hmm. wage for every worker. It will fund universal health care, mm -hmm. universal education, eliminate taxes. It will eliminate all government debt eventually. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to continue funding the federal government at current levels and even maybe uh, increase the funding. Yep. And in addition, on top of that, the, 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 the uh, icing on the cake or the, the, the cherry on top, you'll be able to give every citizen in the United States $100,000. if you uh, Cash. <laughs> if, if you incorporate the, the plan or if we, if we adopt the plan that you are uh, promoting. I, I, I mean, is this correct? Are yes, these, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I guess w what if if I were um, um, you know the average Joe, I would say that, well, this this is sorcery. This is magic. How can I mean this is what peop politicians argue about all the time? You, you can't do it. So and, and also I might add, you, you also indicate that this can be done with no new taxes. In correct. fact, you're going to eliminate tax. Not only will there be no new taxes, well, but you're going to eventually. Uh, I, the, the government will eliminate taxes. So the plan is to provide funding to the government, but if the government wants to keep the taxes, the government can. All right, okay. So, But, 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 but there, there's no need for income tax. Right, because you'll be providing, this plan will provide them with enough funds to run the right, government right. Uh, and, and so that they won't have a need to tax people because they'll have enough money Correct. to do all there's, the things. There's no need, but just to be clear on this point, there are some people who believe the taxes are necessary and have social benefit beyond funding. So, for example, if you put a tax on cigarettes, you improve health. Yeah. So the government can decide to impose tax that for for those other purposes, but yeah, not because yeah. they need the money. Not because they need the money. But, but the to, money's not needed. But to engineer some social effect exactly. or something like exactly. that. Yeah. And and the other thing I think that's a, that's a kind of a a third wire here is that people talk. There's no transfer payments involved. Correct. So so you're not taking money away from one group and giving it to another, which is anathema to a lot of a lot of people. So no new taxes necessarily, mm -hmm. and no transfer payments. Correct. And now now you do this through. Um, uh, an organization or a company, I would call it, that you're calling the American Buyout Consortium, right. uh, A-B-O-C. Um, and it, it revolves around the idea that there is some uh, uh, overproduction and excess capacity in the economy. Um, and I'd like you to kind of explain what you, what you mean by that. Um, because right now the, the economy can't absorb, you say in your book, can't, over, uh, can't absorb the extra uh, uh, overproduction, but you're going to monetize that, that overproduction. Yes, exactly. And, by, and that's where the money, the cash money, is going to get to fund all these things we're talking about because of, of, of the way you've developed this plan to monetize um, the market surplus, which Correct. you say exists in our economy. Uh, maybe a lot of people don't even realize that, that, that it exists. But that is going to generate enough cash monetizing these, uh, uh, th these programs. So, so talk about um, uh, market surplus. What, what is market surplus? What, is it, what does it consist of? Um, market surplus is a function of excess production. 
So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Last year, farmers dumped tens of millions of gallons of milk. wasn't consumed. The milk was produced. It was just dumped out. And it, there was so much milk that was dumped that it created, uh, it created environmental problems. But you can look at every single industry. Every single industry has excess production. So Nike, for example, uh, and as well as every other clothing man manufacturer in the world, now destroys about uh, half their production every year. They burn it, shred it. Otherwise, uh, market prices would plummet. There just isn't enough demand for all that clothing. Uh, Rolex destroys about $600 million of watches every year. So you can go at every, look at every single industry. Every single industry has excess capacity. The real problem that we face today is that because of technology, there is no livable wage that a human uh, can, uh, that allows a human to compete with technology for employment in many industries. And the dire predictions that I'm making in the book are the result of uh, a very rapid expansion of that across many other industries, self-driving cars, drones, yeah. and so forth. So you're saying, if, if, if anything, uh, technology and automation uh, and, and uh, uh, increased uh, ability to produce is going to make that ex excess capacity even even greater than it was before. It's going to accelerate. Now, um, let's let's take a look. I think this is a, a key, in my mind, uh, a, a key uh, part of of, of, of 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 what you're what you're saying. I like the the uh, the, the controller to put up um, uh, slide number one. And this is a this is a chart that you have uh, put that's in your book, and so uh, and and this this uh, uh, illustrates what you have the the six uh, step national vesting management process. And we didn't talk about because this is another key uh, component of of your program is the vesting, and we'll we'll talk about that in, mm -hmm. in a second. So 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 walk us through the steps one through six here, if you will, Bob. Sure. So the basic idea, and I have to tell you, Walt, you said it beautifully, what we're trying to do is take market surplus, excess production, and monetize it. We want to turn it into money. <coughs> but then a key principle is we want to take that money and give it back to the citizens of the United States. We don't want the government to keep it. We don't want it, in some cases, literally laying on the ground rotting. We want to give it to people so they can buy housing, health care, and so forth. So here's how we do it. And the, 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 the six-step process here allows us to take that market surplus, distribute it back to the producers of the market surplus without transfer payments, without tax increases, et cetera. All right, so here's how it works. The economy is still a market economy. It's still a capitalist economy <clears throat> where employers pay wages to their employees and those employees produce something, a good or service of some kind. The but that's the way it always was. The way it nothing, always was. Nothing different. Nothing different. Nothing changes. The employers own that production and they sell it. They get whatever they can. They make whatever profit they can. There's no restriction of any kind on what the employer can do with that production. I ideally, they'll make money. They'll make profit. And stay in business. <clears throat> and stay in business and, and grow and thrive. Now, here's this is kind of a new part, but not really. So, the following steps are actually uh, in operation today, only they're not being done as efficiently as they could. So ABOC, uh, ABOC's a placeholder. Think of ABOC as a placeholder, because really, if the government decided to do this, they could implement this very quickly. ABOC is, is, the, is the company the that consortium. you say, the consortium right. that you say would, would, would run this. Right, and every American citizen, every U.S. citizen is welcome to join the consortium. Right, we, and eventually I think you said that ABOC would actually, uh, would actually employ all Every every uh, uh, government employee who's involved in economic right. activity would then become a, an employee of this of this consortium. Right. If it, okay. So the reason the book's called American Buyout is the the proposal is to buy out uh, the U.S. government. The U.S. To, government. To, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, it's an outsourcing buyout. Okay. So so here's the employ uh, the uh, the workers. So let's let's put that slide back up again. For so there's labor. Yep. Okay. The hammer and the and the, and the uh, 
sewing machine and so forth, a so chip maker. The, the, the details in the book explain how for any member of the labor pool, you can calculate their market surplus. So it's quite precise. So we, okay. we can figure out, regardless of where you work, we can calculate what your market surplus is that you're generating. In other words, everyone's underpaid. There are a few exceptions, but in general, every U.S. citizen is underpaid. Right. And we can calculate what you're, how much you're underpaid. Right. So what's going to happen is ABOC will buy that market surplus from you. So ABOC will pay you an additional paycheck, in effect. Your employer doesn't have to pay you. It's not coming from somebody else in the form of a transfer payment or tax. It's coming from the market surplus. So let's just make sure that, that, that we're clear about this. So you will get a paycheck or wages from your employer Correct. for whatever you do. Yep. And then ABOC will give you another paycheck Correct. based upon the value of the excess production at, at, that they will sell to you at a discounted, discounted rate, right. say you know, 20 cents on the dollar or something right. like so that. A, and this is a good point because ABOC has some other funding obligations that it's taking on. So for any member of labor, they do get a discounted uh, payment uh, based on the market surplus they're generating. Um, but even so, if you're currently making a minimum wage, you'll see your salary just about triple. Right, and there are you have graphs in in the book yeah. that show various uh, uh, um, um, types of jobs and and and, and uh, levels of income, and it shows how uh, uh, that would that would apply how the extra extra income and extra check from ABOC. Okay, right. So, and th this is I'm glad you brought that up because this is very important. Every single U.S. citizen will see an increase in their income without exception. Mm -hmm. So no one's going to have increased taxes. We're not taking money from some and giving it to other. We're taking market surplus and distributing it back to its right, producers. Right. And there's a very nice graph. Uh, we, we don't we, we don't uh, have it here. It's a, but uh, but uh, it shows for these various levels. I think you have uh, for jobs that pay from forty thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand right. dollars a year, and what percentage. Uh, uh, they would get you know, the second check from ABOC. So mm -hmm. let's put that graph back up again, uh, if we can, Zach. And um, so we're at point number four now. So ABOC mm -hmm. receives the, the market surplus from labor, and what, what do they do with it? They go to the central bank, and what? Technically, ABOC exchanges the market surplus at the central bank for cash. You, you can also say they sell it. So ABOC will basically sell the market surplus to the central bank, receive the cash that is used to pay for health care, uh, education, pay the supplemental salaries, uh, fund government programs, and so forth. Okay. Now, um, l l let, me, let me play devil's advocate here. So ABOC will purchase uh, units of, uh, of surplus so what if I'll just give you some 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 jobs here. OK, suppose you're a sales clerk or an auto mechanic mm -hmm. or a waiter or you work on an assembly line. Is there something physical that that you transfer to ABOC? Is there like a is there like an inventory of stuff? Uh, and and I'll, I'll, let me and let me yeah. let me let me part two of that question because you you we, we mentioned before that we're becoming more and more a service economy seventy mm -hmm. percent mm -hmm. I think you quote in your book, and you say that any product that's not consumed like empty seats at movies mm -hmm. and discarded food empty hotel rooms unused production capacity so how how that's not a physical thing how right. how do you how do you take possession of that and what what uh, what value does that have to the central bank that they would pay you for it? Well, it's just a ledger transaction. There, you don't. The, the central bank isn't particularly concerned about making a profit from trading commodities or okay. services of any kind. The, the reason uh, that this works and the and the purpose in uh, tracking the market surplus precisely is to give the the central bank a limit on how much money is distributed. Let me explain that in a little more detail. Right now, there's a program called quantitative easing. Japan has been using quantitative easing since the late 90s. Europe uses quantitative easing. The United States will very soon return to quantitative easing. It's basically the same thing as that graph. 
the way quantitative easing works, the government spends money that it has borrowed. Who did it borrow it from? It, it borrowed it from the Fed. So the Fed bought U.S. debt. The money went to the federal government, which spent it. But the federal government owns the debt. Yep. So it's just lending itself money. Yeah. This is how th th this is what pulled us out of the 2009 recession. The problem with that is you don't know when to stop. The Fed doesn't know how much quantitative easing can we do and not create a new problem. That amount is the market surplus. Right. So you don't you, you, if you wanted to you could somehow take 100 million gallons of milk and store it somewhere and and you know you you know you you could create inventories okay. there's no point in doing okay. it the fed only needs that number that's all the fed needs it just needs to know how much of this can we do without creating so it's a just problem. like a placeholder if you, if you yeah, will yeah it's just yeah. a placeholder okay now i, I want to put up a couple of slides that w talk about why you 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 uh, paint this picture that's going to get more drastic in, in the next couple of years because of automation and robotics and whatever? Let's put up slide number two if we can, the control room. So, um, fifty percent of Americans will lose their jobs to automation by the year twenty thirty. Now that's only mm. ten years away, right, Bob? And that's half the labor force. Correct. Yep. So, so uh, I think the urgency with which you, you, you opened your book and, 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 and the shout out that you made at the early part of the book, I mean, that, that particular statistic would, would just scream that, 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 that uh, uh, the, 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 the wages, you're just, uh, they're, they're not going to be there. Right. So um, now uh, another, another uh, uh, statistic here. Uh, let's look at slide number three, please. And and forty percent of Americans cannot afford uh, um, uh, cannot afford to pay for basic needs. And I think slide number um, five will will elicitate uh, that a little bit further. Okay, so forty million Americans struggle with hunger, and I think that was pointed out. We're sitting here the day after the one of the uh, Democratic debates, and they, they mentioned that number several uh, several times. People uh, uh, in the United States of America, we're, talk we're not talking about you know, some where, third world where country we, in where Africa. Where we throw away half of the food produced. Yeah, the irony of, of, yeah. of, of that, yeah. And um, now, um, let me, I'm gonna read another, another quote uh, from, from the book. Uh, on page um, 131, and I think that there's a maybe slide number four, if we can take a look at that. And okay, if we stra extrapolate that up to 800 million global workers, so mm -hmm. not only will half the American working. What, what, what's the what's the population of American work? The, the, the population in the country is 320 million. How many people in the workforce? Um, if you include government workers, it, it'll vary, but about, say, 140 million in the okay. private sector. Okay, so 70 million, yeah. and that will add up, and, and so the rest of the world will be like 730 million in addition. Uh, yeah. And this is, a, uh, this is a quote from uh, Norbert Wiener, who is a mathematician, philosopher, um, and a professor of math at MIT. He says, it's perfectly clear that automation will produce an unemployment situation in comparison with which the depression of the 19, 19, 1930s, the Great Depression, will seem a pleasant joke. Right. Now, that, that's, that's very strong. That, yeah. that's, uh, um, <coughs> so uh, um, I, I think the key to your proposal, then, is, is managing productivity increase Properly, right? Because right. we're going to get this productivity increase, but we have to manage it, and that's what ABOC, this this entity that you've come up with. Now, let, let's talk a little bit about a concept here that 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 you 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 bring up in your book. That's that's also part of this this equation, and that's called national vesting. We mm -hmm. talked about it, mm -hmm. so that people, everybody, will be paid a minimum livable wage. But also paid a second way. So, that, mm -hmm. what, where is this something you came up with? The national vesting, or what, yes. where does this come yeah. from? Okay. Yeah. So, so well, the, the idea is simple. We, you, the The basic approach is to take the market surplus and distribute it back to the people who produced it in a fair and equitable manner. So, 
when we talk about a minimum wage, the emphasis should be on minimum. There's no cap. There, you know, people will still make hundreds of thousands of dollars at the high end. There's no, there's no upper bound on, on what you're going right. to earn. The, the issue is that uh, for the vast majority, and by, you know, we're talking 95 percent of the population are going to be impacted by automation in the very near future. And uh, the irony of it is we're <laughs> The, the wealth, the value that is being created is staggering, that is not being consumed. So the idea with vesting is let's find a way to take it, take all that extra unconsumed production and distribute it back to the people who are producing it. Not give it to one person, but give it in a way that's fair and equitable to everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and vesting, of course, there, you, in your book you mentioned different levels of vesting mm -hmm. that would be determined by your education level, your training, your, and your experience in doing, doing what you do. Explain that a little bit. Well, the idea is if you get uh, a high school education, you're more valuable than if you don't get a high school education. If you get college, if you have 10 years of experience, these things uh, increase the value that you produce. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who's worked in a particular job for 10 years is going to be far more productive than somebody who's new to that position. Yeah. So when we calculate the market surplus that any individual produces, we do so based on a vesting schedule. And then the whole program will ensure that you make at least a certain okay. amount of money for that level. Now, I want to come up with one, one more, because we're running out of time here, but in order to put a, a quantitative uh, number on this, um, you, you mentioned from 64, 1964 to 2014, productivity increased by 300 percent. Way more than three, yes, but, but yes. Let's say, let's keep, yeah. yeah. And wages stayed stagnant. Mm -hmm. and, and you were able to use that by taking the 300 percent and looking at wages and what they would be. You were able to calculate that right today the market surplus at $15 trillion dollars Annually, so that, that that puts a number on on this whole mm -hmm. whole thing. Fifteen trillion. Now, what is what is the what is the um, 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 our budget? What is our gross national product? Or about what? twenty trillion. Twenty trillion. Yeah. So so you're, you're you're talking about a gigantic number, and I think for purposes of illustration in your book, you you take half of that seven right. uh, seven and a half. Um, so um, well well. Uh, Bob, uh, we're, we're, we're out of time, and maybe what we'll do, because there's a lot of other things that we could discuss that you touch upon in your book on how this impacts um, environmental destruction and causes wars. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the the, the, the tie-ins here are just uh, amazing. I mean, I was uh, uh, um, really, uh, I enjoyed reading the book, and I want to I uh, show it to our audience once again. And uh, how can people get a copy of, of this book? Um, Amazon. They can also go to our website. Uh, the Center for National Vesting is a 501c3 nonprofit. The purpose of it is to educate all of America about how to fix some pretty serious problems. Yeah. Uh, but you can go to Amazon or you can go to our website and AmericanBuyout.com will also take you to the book. Yeah, I think you have a www.AmericanBuyout.com. So yep. AmericanBuyout.com. Yeah. Well. Bob, thank you very much. It's thank been, you very it's much. Been, this well, was fun. Thank, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, and I'd like to remind our audience that uh, you have been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.